Welcome everyone to the Co-Creators Convergence Creator Convo. And tonight we have uh, a beautiful couple, John and Catherine Raymer. And uh, Catherine is going to lead us in a little centering of blessing before we start tonight. And then she is going to introduce her beloved John. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Catherine. Yes, feel our Selves resting in our bodies, our marvelous bodies, that the Creator, His being is holding us up right now. And so we present ourselves, Creator, to you right now. You have many names, but you are one. And we thank you for this time. And we ask a blessing for all the people that are here tonight and those watching, and for the whole world with her many needs. And we thank you for the people that have put this together and we ask blessings on their work. And we ask a special blessing on John as he leads us tonight in this discussion. And we thank you for your love and your kindness and your many blessings in our lives. And this we pray, amen. Thank you. Um, I'm really honored to introduce John Reimer. I have um, witnessed him writing this book and taking notes and feeding deer and running in the house and taking, getting his notes and running up to the computer. He's really worked hard on this. But I'd like to say a little bit about him. His mother, Sarah Bernhardt, a Nupiat born from Teller, Alaska. And his father is John G. Reimer. He was German born from Kansas. John was born in Nome, Alaska, and he was raised in Anchorage, Alaska. He has three children, Robbie, Holly, and Anthony. John received his GED at Anchorage Community College. He later went to get his bachelor's degree in biological science with teaching credentials at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Then he got his master's degree in education administration, American Indian Administration graduation program from Pennsylvania State University. Later, he went for his PhD program in education administration, again, American Indian Administration graduate program at Penn State he didn't complete his dissertation, but I've been kidding him and saying, you now have completed your dissertation with this book because <laughs> he's worked so hard. Um, he has had many jobs and I'm not gonna go into all of those um, because of time, but he has worked always for American Indians in the area of education, either as a researcher or teacher, principal, line officer for the BIA and traveling to many states. He has, um, the other thing on a personal note I wanna say is how very, very proud I am of him and how I have been moved to tears at different parts of this book um, because underlying this book you'll see his worldview emerging, his, his Inupiaq values, his Native American values, and his love for the country, our constitution, the people, all people, especially the underprivileged. 
Um, so with this, I would like to introduce John Brenner. I wanted to, I wanted to say that Malcolm Young uh, and I worked together for many years out, out of Arlington, Virginia. And I see Sandra Fox is online. And I worked with Sandra in the Bureau of Indian Affairs for many years. First, I'd like to give greetings to each and every one of you. And thanks to all, all of you who are part of the co-creators convergence, and especially Noel, Karen, Bob, and Zachary, Zachary, who introduced Catherine and I to the CCC. I'm honored to be given a chance to talk to you this afternoon. Also, hello, hello to my family and relatives and the friends who are watching. And thanks to Catherine for coaxing me into doing this. I have actually had to reread parts of my book all over again, and I've been surprised and even shocked by some of what I have written. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the name of my book is What's in Your Head and On Your Mind. It's a narrative describing how, what, why, and the way we think and act the way we do. The title is meant to sound like a metaphor. The title of this book literally describes the essence of us. Everything that we are and will become originates in our head. And some of what we think up in our head, we, we act out in real time. Inside our skull is what is called gray matter, lots of it. And it is in the driver's seat, guiding and dictating the functions of our body and the thoughts that are formed in our mind and in our psyche. It actually defines us. The thinking part of our brain is our mind. And it decided to refer to ourselves as sentient beings. Even naming ourselves Homo sapiens, the wise ones. No other mammal has ever been that presumptuous. This book is about my, my own interpretation and the speculation of what, how, why, and the way we think and act the way we do. I interpret what I see, hear, and have read, and it is subjective in the sense that it all has been filtered through my own brain, my mind, my psyche, soul, and my heart. Sometimes I think that there are even bits and pieces of past knowledge within me, lodged in my genes that have been passed down from my ancestors. Now in the book, am I talking loud enough, I hope? In the book, I write of controversial and perhaps unsettling notions that I perceive in others, some even within myself but I believe what I have written is as close to reality as I am able to come up with based on my own situation, based on my experience, my knowledge and my worldview. The worldview that has been gained through many decades of just living in and on Mother Earth. Now telling it like it is, telling it like I see it is my prerogative, but more than that, what I have realized is that it is required of a writer when he or she writes about controversial and sensitive topics and issues is to be fully truthful, understand fact from fiction, and to seek to get down to the bare bones of it, even at the cost of offending readers. The approach I will take is to touch on some issues, problems, events, situations, circumstances, and conditions that I pose in the book. They are not in any particular order, and they by no means cover the book. If you had a chance to look at the, my table of contents, you will note that. Table of contents, you will note that. Pardon? You're doing fine, John. Well, thank you. We just ask, okay. remind everyone to please stay muted. Uh, a little background noise. Yeah, because the background yeah, noise is it. distracting to, uh, to John. So please stay muted. Out of courtesy, we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I can hear you. Okay. So let me begin. 
I begin the introduction of this book with a quote from Eric Fromm. I don't know if any of you know him. He was a psychologist, popular in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He's now passed away. He makes an interesting statement. He states that human existence poses a question. Here's Fromm's question. At the moment of birth, life asks man and woman a question, and this question he or she must answer. He and she must answer it at every moment, not the mind, not the body, but the person who thinks and dreams, who sleeps and eats and cries and laughs, the whole person must answer it. What is the question he poses? He goes on to say, how can we overcome the suffering, the imprisonment, the shame, which the experience of separation creates? How can we find union within ourselves, with our fellow men, with nature? Man has to answer this question in some way. And even in insanity, an answer is given by striking out reality outside of ourselves and thus overcoming the fright of separateness. The book is called Zen Buddhism and Psychoanalysis. And it was printed in 1969 and updated in 1974. Now what he says is a, is a simple and a direct question that it speaks volumes. Similar questions other philosophers and theologians have posed, but he gets right to the essence of it. Again, each person must answer it. And even by not answering it, an answer is given. Ponder that. My speculations are just that. They are my personal conjuring, but I try to root them in reality, sometimes not the reality I like or prefer. Bare bones, root, soil, bedrock, digging down and exposing our important notions that I keep going back to. It all starts in the head and it ends in the head. Hence the title, which gives me lots of leeway to bring up just about anything. And I do. Look at my table of contents. <laughs> Now think about this, the whole and entire human world that we inhabit has been conjured up in our individual and in our collective heads, some of which we play out in real time. It all resides inside our skull. And today more than ever is put on paper, placed somehow in clouds and in memory banks and hard drives and zips and thumbs. So much of our knowledge is becoming more and more stored in electromechanical devices. What happens when the power grids and electro electronic infrastructure begin to fail? Who are our knowledge keepers? As I proceed, I will po pose some questions. And in the interest of time, I ask that you spend some time later on cogitating on them. If you wish, at a later time, I will provide you the summary which contains all of the questions. So let me continue. I want to say something about the un unsettling events and dangerous things that are happening all around this country. I am hearing over and over again a prevailing attitude of many people today to just move on, to look forward and not backward, just let it go. I have heard it said that maybe things will just get better if we let it all be, move forward. Besides, I am too busy to get involved. I need to make a living and just get by. Why do so many, including many of our so-called leaders say that? This is a prime example of faulty and muddle-headed thinking. And I have a chapter devoted to faulty thinking. It's called, the stinking thinking syndrome. When you read it. Again, I post questions. You may wish to ponder them at some later time when we're not constricted by time limits imposed by this session. Uh, I have a couple, uh, let me uh, mention right now. In times like today in this country, are some issues and certain topics too sensitive? too controversial 
too emotional to talk about or write about? Is there an obligation to just be quiet and let things go for the sake of those who may object and dislike what may be said and written? Now, Catherine suggested that we, we should come back to these questions at the end of the presentation and discuss, discuss them if there is time. With regard to the writing of this book, the approach I have taken was necessary in order to maintain a sense of honesty to myself and to others. What I present is meant to allow the reader to come to their own conclusions, recognizing that other individuals may see things differently and that is okay, even when it conflicts with one's own view and beliefs. I'll start with the notion that we are in a crisis of reason. I infer and even say outright that we are at a crisis of reason in the way so many of us think and act and how we treat one another or certain others of us. I touch on that crisis throughout the book with many common and everyday examples, some of which are confounding and brings up many questions. Some are disturbing. Of what significance today are the rules our ancestors have developed, the rules of reason, of logic, inference, reasoning, correct thinking, and what determines truth against falsity? What is object objectivity? The sifting and sorting of information and data to make informed judgments and decisions, the scientific method, and all those other ways we have used to make sense of our world, to define reality, our environment, and in communicating with each other in ways that mean something and make reasonable sense, and for making transactions among each other that are sensible and which fosters trust. It appears that whole segments of the American people don't know or have decided not to use these rules as a way to deter from falsity, as well as how to ascertain reality from fancy, fantasy and magical thinking. And instead, to believe in stuff that make no sense at all. What I see in here are that many individuals and groups are listening to and taking to heart wild and made up conspiracies, some of which are so far-fetched and evil that it makes you wonder what is going on ahead in the head of such individuals. This is di discussed in some detail in my book. Let me pose a few questions. So what is happening to some of us? And just what is, just what is going on here? Why is science so suspect? Scientists too. And even those individuals who have chosen to attend college to become further educated. Why is global warming, climate change, wild and unpredictable weather fluctuations poo-poo by so many of us? Why do so many of us believe that, believe that God is causing it all because he is mad at us. I see some dangerous consequences in, for this country, in particular for certain groups of citizens who are seen as different and less than equal, and for some reason are unworthy of basic respect and equal treatment. What is the road we are now traveling, and where is it leading this country? I also explore the treatment of why American Indian, the American, why the American Indian before and after the enactment of our constitution and that of uh, Alaska natives, the way they are treated like foreigners and enemies for over 200 years. What is that the root of this inhumane treatment of the American Indian and all the other indigenous people? Let me give you an, an example that makes absolutely no sense. There have been instances of people telling American Indian and Alaska Natives to go back to your own country <laughs> and telling other American citizens who are non white the same thing. Why? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, our tripartite governance, and the formulation of the Republic of the United States of America were spared by a breaking away from European tyranny. 
and founded on the notion of unity, working cooperatively, sharing a vision of equality and individual and inalienable, inalienable rights, making the rule of law that levels the judicial and legal playing field, investing the ultimate power of governance in the people, the citizens, we the people. It turns out they meant certain people. Why, why, are, why are we called the United States? Just what does the notion of unite, uniting and united infer? What does this mean to the nation, to the individual states and to their citizens? Are we becoming the not so United States, the falling apart United States? Why is it all falling apart? And why are there such deep and fundamental divisions and disunity and the killing of our own fellow citizens? Not a change of topic. Another topic that throw, one runs throughout the book are our ancestors, the distant and not so distant ones. I acknowledge the role of our ancestors who for many hundreds and thousands of years contributed to and ensured our success and that of our survival. Remember that we're rel we were relatively small and vulnerable compared to other large and hairy mammals lurking behind every tree. I mean, we are here today because of them, our ancestors. It's all about what our ancestors did and what they did not do. I look, at our, look back at our human history and imagine what our ancestors went through and speculate on how we, near, we early humans found it necessary to come together in groups, first as family groups, simply because of the great benefits of several to many people coming together to help one another to share and help ensure the health, safety, and welfare of the group. Also, our ancestors recognized human diversity and those who had specific talents, outlooks, perceptions, skills, sensitivity, visions, intelligence, and so forth. So when I refer to our ancestors, I mean that they are literally and really ancestors to all. Do you remember all means all? There are some of us today, even in this modern day and age, who have not broken the ancestral bond that ties us to our ancestors, just as whole groups of people today have suffered this, severed this bond and this trust. Just what did our ancestor do and not do that ensured our survival as a species? Why and what have we gotten what and why and what have we forgotten that our ancestors taught us long ago? What was the wisdom and knowledge they gained for us that ensured our very survival? What are the consequences down the road for having lost and forgotten so much of our ancestral wisdom? To, to elaborate on that topic a little more, I have a title in my book called The Role of Culture, Ethnicity, nationality, belief systems, values, and worldview. The theme of this chapter is to formally define culture, ethnicity, nationality, and so forth. I discuss the uh, uh, culture's past role the pro and the problem that cultural norms, values, and prohibitions are being abandoned and lost and replaced with written laws written rules, statutes, and regulations. The question, some questions I ask, is there a definable culture in this country? If so, what is it? What happens when the men, men, melting pot fails to melt? Is, is society equivalent to culture? Next, I describe in my book, our journey, as if we were in a boat on life's sea which without a tiller to guide and steer our boat, we are carried willy-nilly across the waters of life in a random and hapless fashion with no direction home. So what's life without a tiller? Without a tiller, just what are people missing? 
as we traverse the road of life or sail the waters of life. What opportunities and major mileposts or life markers are passed by and missed and squandered? Those lucky enough who become elderly will have to confront this at their end. We will all have to confront the Grim Reaper who will ask us questions that we cannot or do not wish to answer. The Christian Bible, for example, provides many of us a tiller as we travel life's path. There are, of course, many other tillers. Another chapter in this book is titled, The Importance of Nature and the Natural World. I describe the importance of being aware and cognizant of our surroundings, especially the natural world and the environment, and in particular, the care and protection of our plants and animals who we share this Mother Earth with and who give us our sustenance. It has come down to this. Huge meat factories and vast monocultured plant growing companies that now provide us all the nutri nutrition we need. And it all comes up. It all comes in wrapped in pleasing squares of black and transparent plastic. Whatever happened to the cow and the cabbage? Just where, just where do the following fit into this scheme? The inanimate things, the ground, the soil, the underground things, the land, the fields, growing food and essential minerals, forests, water, air, and mother earth. Just who nurtures, nourishes, and protects us, protects us, all of us. In another chapter, I write about the power of myth, ritual, and ceremony. Now, if you want to be given the skinny on the power of myth and ceremony and ritual, read or listen to Joseph Campbell. He's written a number of books, uh, The Power of Myth for One, and has a number of, of uh, ex excellent uh, audio tapes. And just to hear his rich baritone voice is worth it. The Power of Myth, Ritual, and Ceremony. You may also consult your local Native American spiritual leader for guidance on the power of myth and the importance of ritual and ceremony. Myth, ritual, ceremony are still with us, only much of it has been brought down to the trivial and the profane. Profane meaning, not before the temple, hence not sacred. To fun, excitement, self-indulgence, what are some of the ritual and ceremonies we the moderns do? In the book, I explore what I believe is another crisis and it has to do with males. So many men have lost or were not taught, mentored or never had to go through coming of age ritual and ceremony, the kind that bestows importance and meaning upon the stages and passages of life and of shedding off, leaving behind and of becoming and of obligation and responsibility and of what is expected of adult males. So what is missing for men? And just what is important to men as we grow up and mature and become adult males? What's our role and our purpose now? Just what do women think about this? To continue, our ancestors created and then practiced ritual and ceremony. As they got better at it, found they could confront their fears and uncertainties in ways that were mostly life affirming and supportive and fulfilling. In other words, we began to understand that we could do something affirmative and proactive in order to counteract all the unknowns that confronted us almost daily, which we could not or did not understand, living as we did in a harsh and unforgiving environment. In this chapter, I explore other aspects of myth and ritual and ceremony of times past as practiced by all groups and races of people around the world. Most of our ancient myth, ritual and ceremony is lost in our past. There was no written record, nothing left relative to their purpose, meaning and significance. And not much is left from memory that has been passed on from gener one generation to the next. 
It is now given to select individuals, artists, architects, visionaries, builders, construction companies. Our man-made structures are now built by banks, for-profit corporations, governments, rich people, for all the rest of us to become inspired by, but which we played no part in except through perhaps our tax dollars. Now it's professional sport and game owners and players whose allegiance is to cities and to the people in them. Money and the selling of stuff is the purpose of their existence. And our celebration of past and historical and other national and local events are now celebrated by partying, drinking, eating, dressing up, fireworks, spending money, buying stuff, and so forth. We are no merely sedentary and passive participants of elaborate events and activities, and most of them cost money for the privilege of attending. We have lost involvement, the involvement of the whole community and group who used to be involved in the planning, arrangement, and preparation of momentous tasks of ceremony and ritual who, with great anticipation, would participate and be a part of something bigger than our individual selves. I could go on, but I guess you get the picture. Anyway, in this book, I make a pitch for what we could or should do now to get back to a place where myth, ritual, and ceremony again become part of our lives as it did with our ancestors. Now it's okay to let them be contrived and made up, but it will be important that all of us are intimately involved and participate. Cooperation, community, planning, constructing, everyone who is able, contributing as to their ability, multifaceted, elaborate, simple, fulfilling, worth doing, utilizing everyone's skills, and most importantly, recognizing and celebrating the diversity and the tal talents of all the different people in the community. Each and every single one of us proclaims to, that we are human, human beings, homo sapiens. We are the wise ones. We are all part of humanity, no one excluded, but yet we do exclude. Now going back to ancient times again, I write of the small and all but forgotten group of hominids who the, the archeologists believe never numbered more than 16,000 to, to 70,000 max at any one time when they lived and thrived on this mother earth. The Neanderthals, I write of my favorite ancestor, the, the Neanderthals, our close cousins who the archeologists say showed the first signs of humanness who buried their dead as if they were an afterlife 30, 35,000 years ago. And 150,000 years before that, they arranged stalactites and stalagmites into elaborate and intricate forms and placements deep inside caves found in France. Think about that. Just what the heck were they up to? 175,000 years ago. Remember, we depict them as slow, hairy, pondering cavemen, meaning women too. Remember the cartoons of the Stone Age caveman, thick bodied, hairy, club, dumb looking and club carrying. When I write about our ancestors, I include the Neanderthals as our close relatives. Now our ancestors role and what they did and did not do is a thread that weaves this whole discourse together. They are the reason we are here today, that we have lost our connection to them or more specifically, some of us have, Other, others have not. And it will be good for you to discover who these other people are, those who have not forgotten and why. I near the end of my discourse, describe the importance of going beyond our own mundane existence and back to some things that used to play a part in our lives. For example, the celestial panoply appearing above our heads in the nightly sky, now all but lost in the haze of smog and lights and uninterest. After traveling up there and walking on the moon, 
we confirm that she is not made of Swiss cheese, but just rocks and dirt. The moon is now a destination we may get to travel to if we are rich enough. It will soon become another vacation spot for the rich and the famous. The center of the universe, we still think we are. We who are earthbound, the sun and the moon and the stars, no longer do we look up at them in awe. So caught up, caught up in we are in, in our technology and in internets and clouds and plastic screens in pursuing the illusory American dream, making lots of money, buying cheap stuff and, and enamored by who's who and what's trending. Going back 3000 years ago, why were the Greeks so caught up in starry celestial things? As for the moon, who by the way is a she, how many names have we given her? We no longer sow, plant, harvest, or look to the moon for our earthly guidance and for our sustenance, nor do we follow her monthly phases, nor consider her gentry, gen, gentle gravitational pull as she coaxes and persuades the menstrual cycles, the menstrual cycles of her daughters on this mother earth. Why? By naming the moon, we become close to her, kin to her. We were in turn given assurance she would come again each night to light the sky. The sun too, the solstices, the equinoxes, and all the sun-centered ceremonies performed by our ancestors. In this book, the book, I go into some detail into these. I could go on and on. Um, I'll close now with a few chapters from the conclusion of the book. And I'll go ahead and read this. In the very last paragraph of what follows, I sum it all up, or at least try to. In other words, I sought to strike at several levels of our own limited awareness of reality. And it is this awareness, awareness of where we're at that I write about. So I tried to incorporate several levels of meaning here. You must should take some time and think about, mull over, reflect on and cogitate on this last part. And at some future time, you may let me know what you think about this. Here's the quote from the conclusion of the book. In conclusion, somewhere along the road that got us to where we are now, we have shed the long, the long held and humankind protective notions of sharing, caring, helping one another, the individual's responsibilities to others, especially the male's role to protect and the female's role to nurture. The advantages of collective action and support that ensured the welfare of all members of the group, which also ensured the welfare of the individual. As one, as one matures physically, the ideal is to also mentally mature and become a fully functioning adult and utilize all the life skills that we were taught or were provided, as well as all the ways and means, the, the other tools and the other tools provided by our parents, our family, and society to help us think and act and thrive as a mature adult, to unselfishly take personal responsibility for our lives, the lives and welfare of our neighbors, and not blame others for the poor choices that we have made and we may have made in life. We marvel all the, at all we have done, and some of us even believe we are an advanced people then why have we so failed so miserable to take care of each other? We who represent the only living species left on this mother earth, homo sapiens, the wise ones. It may very well come down to this. We are at a crossroads. We have to decide which road we shall travel. One takes us downhill, a dead end. And if we continue to travel it, there will be a time of no come, turning back. The other road we may take will continue to take us uphill, back onto the slope we began climbing eons ago, way back when, as we gra gradually began to shed the fog of unknowing. Our destiny has been interrupted, 
and there is hope that we may continue our uniquely human journey as we have from ancient times to the present when it will be a new path that we will see now that is laid before us and we must take it. We will then resume our journey and we will evolve to a place and a time when the bad and evil within us is slain and good and the beautiful is laid before us for all to see, to hear, to touch, to taste and to feel. We will finish the work began in the beginning that was left unfinished. We will lift up justice, which slipped through the crack of creation from the depths, from the abyss to its proper place and all of life will sigh in relief. The end. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope now, uh, Bravo. Did, did we, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you're interested in, but those questions, the two questions I, I posed, is there any interest in talking about them at this point? Or, or, or what direction should we go from here? No. Okay, I no. would suggest that your beloved uh, Catherine come back into the picture. And then um, what we're going to do is, I think it would be great to go uh, to first entertain comments uh, that people have okay. about your encyclopedia of, <laughs> of consciousness you presented. <laughs> you know, it's just been wonderful. Um, makes me, you know, uh, you know, maybe that's why it took so long for this dissertation to come out because you it's so comprehensive and so wonderful. So um, I'm going to just, uh, if you would like to speak, please keep yourself muted. If you'd like to speak, um, raise your hand or if you don't have your video on, send us a message in the chat. So I'm going to pass this, uh, the talking stick first to uh, Karen Trujillo Heffernan. Karen. Thank you. So beautiful. So uh, my first comment is um, I worked a little bit with Catherine and John and Catherine invited John and John and I spoke on the phone a few times and um, kind of alluded to the fact that he wasn't quite sure what he would say for an hour and a half. <laughs> and you could talk for the next three hours. I mean, what you just said in 50 minutes we could unpack like every moment of that. So I honor you for saying yes. I thank you. I cannot wait to read the book and just want the double, you know, version, both of your books. I'm getting those. Yet there's just so much richness. And I wrote something in the chat, like I would love to get this book in the hands of the public schools, in the hands of the children and the parents, you know, to really, um, I think the children do know these things and they resonate with them. And sometimes I can speak for myself as a child, I was um, talked out of my own wisdoms that you've several things you've shared on this call tonight, you know, through other authorities. So, so it's a little bit of my comment. And please, we really invite you, this is the rich part of these co-creative co conversations is we wanna hear from all of you. So um, raise your hand as Noelle said, let us know in the chat. We can help you unmute if you need that. I say one thing in, in response to what you said. You bet. Go ahead. No, no. Sure. And um, then we'll go to Beverly. She had her hand up. Okay. Um, my original thought was to go chapter by chapter and describe each one. And I tried that, but it didn't work. So I ended up just taking some salient points. And uh, there's a whole lot I did not talk about. If you. Uh, if you look at the table of contents, I know I sent that earlier, but I don't know if I don't know who got a copy of it. And, and I, I, after listening and reading his book, I agree with you, Karen. I said that to John. I said, you know, this could be a textbook for schools. So it's it's there's a lot to dwell over and young people to think about. 
we have a comment from Tex. He says, indeed, a cyclopedia of consciousness. Mahalo and congratulations, John. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Tex. Tex. Thank you, Tex. I like your last name, <laughs> Tex. That's my middle name. <laughs> Hello, Uncle. I see my daughter, Rebecca Bird, is here, too. There's a phone. Is, does that mean she's calling in? It, uh, it, it yes. does. Yes. And uh, OK, and now Beverly would like to make a comment. And then maybe maybe Rebecca would like to make a comment. But let's go to Beverly next, please. Hello, my dear uncle. I'm very proud of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it, Thank you. I think it should be in all the schools. Because I think people need to be reminded of survival. Survival of not only individually, but as a whole. And to do that, it means coming together, just as you were saying. And it means being taught those things that have been hidden and swept away over the years. And I want a copy of that book. I'll be ordering a copy of it because I think it is so important. And I'm very proud of both of you, by the way. And I love you. Thank you, Beverly. Beautiful sentiment. And we did put in the chat, if anybody can, can catch the chat, that uh, mm -hmm. um, Bobby, you put it in there. Uh, Catherine is offering the book for $20. And so yeah. I don't know if that's, that's just for John's book, right, Catherine? Well, it well, it was 25 with postage. That was about $3 more, 28 And so for this group, we said, we'll, we'll just do the postage and $20 is what we'll charge. And you can um, email kathreimer at aol.com. If you send your check, please put uh, your name and your address clearly. So thank you. Yeah. But it, and, uh, and it's and it's twenty dollars. Not we're we're making it twenty for this group. Okay. Yeah. And and as you can see, it was self-published. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone else like to jump into the conversation here? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to go to uh, Malcolm and Ann. I'm going to unmute you. And must be muted. Here. I would like you now. Can you hear me? Here. Can you hear me now? Just faintly. Can you go closer to the uh, computer? We can faintly hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. I think I would like to underscore what has been said, but to add on to that and say, I think this administration under Jill Biden, who is really into education and I think would have a heart for what you have written, John. I think you should send her and um, some of your thoughts, send her the book. And so, and encourage them to maybe um, present it to the whole country that way. And so he could get it. <laughs> but I do think that's exactly, I think they would have a heart for it. I think they would have a heart for it. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you Ann. Uh, we have a comment from Josh in the chat. He said, amazing job, John. Each chapter <laughs> sounded so deep and we just got to skip one stone across each ocean. I am very curious to read more about many subjects covered. And um, I would like to say, I did see the table of contents. It was too long to put in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> he must have 35 <laughs> chapters. <laughs> so I missed them in there. <laughs> I couldn't stop writing. <laughs> yeah. 
And I just want to say hello to Josh and Kristen and Rebecca. I said it to Timber, but my kids are there here now too. Wish we could see your pictures, but I love you and good to see you and listening to John. Thank you. Awesome. And we also have another chat and this is from Jill. She said, I would like to order both books and I'm grateful for the invitation to tonight's presentation. Much to ponder. I agree wholeheartedly. So much happening in the world today, as long as it lasts. And um, she makes a very cogent observation there that uh, I think we're the only species that destroys its nest. So, uh, and then also someone else asked in the chat, Catherine, do you have a two for special? If we want to get both of your books, we send $40 or how would that work? That would be fine. Um, or, or if you're going to buy two, I guess eighteen dollars uh, each. Then, okay. Oh if boy! Gonna... I mean, wow. I th I think twenty dollars each would be fabulous because then there's some shipping. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. We also have another. We have some very bashful people on the. They like to type. On the call tonight, but they are contributing, so thank you. Uh, we have a message here from um, Bellarini. I would really like to get a copy of your book. It sounds too interesting. I am in education and would love to share it with them. And her name is Trish, Trish Bellarini, if I'm saying that correctly. So thank you, Trish. So, <laughs> so uh, for those and, that... And could, Go ahead, Kathy. Could you... Oh, I'm sorry. Could you post the e email, army email, um, maybe again, in case they need to know who to write to for the book? I will do that. This is Bob. I did it above and I'll do it again right now. And um, also to say, for those that are unfamiliar with how to capture the chat, because it's all there um, uh, with the Catherine's email address and whatnot, uh, you go to the bottom, you, you open up the chat, scroll to the bottom of the chat, and to the far right, there'll be three dots. If you click on that, it'll say save chat. And then it'll be saved as a text file on your computer, in your documents, subfolder Zoom, subfolder today's date. And you can grab that chat, it's a text file. Uh, a little hard to read, so you just throw it into a Word document, and you'll have the whole thing it's formatted. So really easy to save the chat to have this information. Right, and you could also get it uh, on our co-creators convergence where we had the, if you're on Facebook, where we had the event announcement, I also put Catherine's uh, contact uh, email in there as well. So anyone else want to raise their hand or put a comment? Okay, we have Malcolm. Let's unmute him. There we go, go ahead, Malcolm. This is really a question for John. As I think about, I'm going to give this book too. Uh, how how readable is it? It's a fascinating encyclopedia, as everybody has said. And I'm just wondering who or what are the who could actually get at least partway through it. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Okay, I'll, I'll just uh, translate that for you. He's wondering um, the book, how thick is it? What, you know, how readable is it? Is it more like an encyclopedia? Is it more like a textbook? Is it, how many pages is it? And is it in a readable? I think all your chapters are fairly <laughs> short. So people could take little bites. It's uh, 348. 348. 348 to the end. 348. I, I have an extensive a, appendix to it where I, I've talked about an issue or, or a topic or something. And I put in the appendix a lot more detail, a lot more detail about the subject for those that are interested. It, otherwise, it's 332 pages. Mm -hmm. Including the, uh, the appendix? No, if you could include the appendix, it goes all the way to 348 pages. Oh, that's still what, that's terrific. 
What did he say? I said that's a very readable. That's very readable, okay. he said. <laughs> well, you know what my brother said when I asked him if he's reading my book and he says, I am. He says, I put it in the bathroom and I go there every day to read it. <laughs> Take it, with it, take it with you while you're in line to get your vaccine shot. <laughs> That's another good place. <laughs> so, John, this is Bob. I uh, uh, Like others, I really, really appreciate your presence this evening, all the work that you've put into this and how um, important this is to our time. I was particularly attracted also to the comment you made about, um, you know, we the people and who is that really and uh, who does that <laughs> represent? I'm going to put in the chat uh, one of our recently now favorite TED Talks by, um, there it is right here, by Mark Charles. And it's, uh, his TED Talk is called We the People, the Three Most Misunderstood Words in U.S. History. And there it is in the chat, which includes a link to the TED Talk. Um, he actually ran for president of the United States in 2020 uh, on some party ticket that I don't remember. Uh, it's a Green Party. Was it? Uh, and uh, I think it was a Green Party. It's the 17 minutes is really an eye opener about um, the way we operate today, um, based on the assumption that we the people means everyone, and how grossly inaccurate that is. It, it also talks about the doctrine of discovery. Is that in your encyclopedia? The oh, doctrine. The doctrine of the doctrine of discovery which is from the 1400s where basically the Europeans, I think it was a papal bull even said, uh, you know, if, if you discover it, it's yours. And so when the Europeans came to uh, America, they quote discovered it so they could take it. So Mark Charles said he'd like to discover everyone's wallets and keys in the audience, so he could take them. Just leave, leave them laying out, and he'll take. He'll discover them and take them home. He'll discover them and take them home. That's how much. But it's still being used in Supreme Court justifications for land grabs of Native American land land grabs. So it is a very interesting talk. Or just Google him, Mark Charles. Um, we the people. Uh, we the people, and you'll find him. So, I, and, go ahead, John. Um, I, I spent an, an inordinate amount of time reading the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the amendments, you know, and so forth, and uh, uh, reading what other people have said about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally had a, a, a chapter in the book about, uh, you know, the Constitution, uh, democracy, Bill of Rights, and so forth, but I took it out. It was just too much. So. Well, you're more well-researched than many people in elected office. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things, if you see the book and you see the colors... Yeah, but it's difficult to hear you, Catherine. If you see these colors, I know a lot of Native Americans will recognize it right away that they represent the medicine wheel colors. So John chose that on purpose. And at one point I said, why don't you call it the East direction? Because that's the mind. And then what's in your head and on your mind. But anyway, he did honor our people by having the colors of, of wholeness and integrity. <laughs> something, something interesting too, is that it's amazing how hard it is to get a cover page. <laughs> It, it took me over a month, and that's that's not necessarily the, the cover I wanted, but it was it was the one I had to go with. Wow! I, I in fact thought it would be a very simple, uh, you know, project to just do a cover, but it's not that simple. Well, I've never published a book, so I wouldn't, you know, you two just amaze me. It, you know, that. So you know, in your eighth decade and, and publishing self-publishing books, my hat's off to you. I have one comment that I'm going to go to Summer Rose. Uh, Pamela Raines suggests, dear John, write another book on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Now that you're warmed up, sure. Yeah, you got this book. <laughs> there you go. Another one. 
there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> and we'll have you back on a couple months from now. Yeah, a couple months from now, you'll have that. Uh, you'll have a double PhD. So, Summer uh, Rose, you can, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Would you like to jump in here? All right. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful readings, really uh, very touching. And yes, I, I love the uh, Power of Myth, great book. So I'm glad that you referenced that a lot. And I guess my big question is, pardon me for not knowing, but Catherine, what's your book? Um, to get these two books for one, I'm sure they're both magnificent because John's book sounds great, but unless I, I came in like 12 minutes late, so maybe I miss I missed something, but I'd love to hear a little summary of your book. I believe they have a recording of it probably that you could listen to, but the name of the book is The Chrysalis, Native and White in One Breath. And it basically uh, tells my experience of growing up as a native and white girl in a society that didn't accept the native side. And the um, up until I was 19 where I became suicidal and then finally broke through and came back to this wonderful Mount Hood and all the glory of being rescued and finding God and the Lord and finding myself back to who I am and accepting that part of me, both parts, proud of both parts. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, Summer Rose, if you go to our um, website, co-creatorsconvergence.com, you will be able to see the um, uh, the recording. You can watch her whole uh, show, her and, whole presentation. It's called a show. It was so beautiful. And just put it in the chat also. Oh, Bob just put it in. Okay, you put the YouTube in there? Yep. Okay. Uh -huh. Wonderful. But, but if you go to the Co-Creators Convergence uh, archive page, you're also going to get six more years of conversations. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some very interesting folks on these uh, creator, Co-Creator Convos. And you have them every week, don't you? Every On Thursday. Thursdays. Every yeah. Thursday. It's all Kat, it's all Karen's fault. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. comment that Catherine was um on February 4th. And so it was very it's well worth watching the replay. Um, and thanks that Bob and Noel are light partners. They're also like technical wizards. So you kind of ask for it and then they're like, it's in the chat. It's in the chat. So uh, I, there's, I think they're still trying to catch up on that billion dollars dropped into my bank account so we can uh, scatter it around the world the way we want to use. But I think they're working on that. Yeah, we should give us a little more time on that one. But uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, John, well, just any like, you know, maybe one or two, there's probably many, but like maybe one of the things that you really like were challenged or grappled with as you were putting the book together? Great question. Great question. I guess, I guess what, got, what, what got me started was the notion I had of uh, just, just what do I know? What do I believe? Why do I believe what I believe? You know, and I, I had to kind of grapple with that. Uh, we take so much for granted, but to, 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 to think about that, uh, you really have to get down to the bare bones of things to, to, to uh, and, and be real honest with yourself in, in terms of just what do I believe? Why do I believe what I believe? And is some of what I believe, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, less, less than honest, truthful, and uh, so, you know, that's one of the things I grappled with was uh, being honest with myself in terms of my own beliefs. And then, you know, thinking about what are the beliefs of others and why do others believe what they believe? And, you know, that led me to the notion of, of, of why we think the way we think, why we act the way we think, you know, what, what is behind all of that? So, you know, when I, the, fir the first, the introduction of the book deals with the brain and, and the function of the brain and those, those kind of things that are were so much interesting to me. And 
I've, I've even come to think of, uh, you know, you've heard, you've, you've heard the phrase, uh, I'm of two minds. Well, I really do think that sometimes our, our, our brain is a separate from who we think we are. That, um, that it, and, and you know, that, that our, our brain is, is in control. And sometimes it leads us in places we don't want it to lead us. And it's like we have, we have heard that, you know, you have a conscience, something sitting on your shoulder that tells you this. And you know that 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 whole thing about about uh, um, we're of two minds. Um, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> it, it says it better. <laughs> oh, wonderful! I totally agree. Summer Joy, Summer just had to leave, or she's going to leave. She is a newlywed, so just a couple months so hubby is home and, her, and uh, so thank you for coming always find us here thursday nights we use the same zoom same time we have fascinating guests but i'm going to get right back to what john just said about the two minds i've decided i've got the ego mind that like when i was born like some malware was put in my brain and that made me just perceive everything in a materialistic way. And then as I've grown and matured, almost 70, um, I feel like I have my spirit brain. And that one is, is talking louder. The ego one was always like blaring and was so nasty. And the, the spirit brain is coming in going like, now, now, don't, don't forget who you are, your love, your love and their love. And we're all connected. We're all we're all one. So that's kind of where I'm going. Kind of follow up on what you were saying. I totally agree. And now Pamela would like to jump in here, so I'm going to ask her to unmute. Can you unmute there? We go. Just, yeah, I just <coughs> discovered something called the Heart Math Institute, mm -hmm. and it's scientifically based that we actually have brain in our hearts and. I'm just learning about it, but it's really fascinating. And it sounds like that that's more where the spirit comes from and that the heart um, really should be in charge of the brain. So I don't know that much about it. If it sounds fascinating, do you look up Heart Math Institute and they'll explain it to you. But I just think that's a really interesting new concept. And the whole sense of, resonating our hearts together and resonating with the trees and resonating with the earth and putting ourselves in coherence. So it's fascinating to me. Um, so I'll learn more about it and maybe some of you will too. <laughs> so another hopeful thing, right? Absolutely. I have studied a little bit uh, heart math and there are actually more signals going from the heart to the brain than the brain does to the heart. Mm -hmm. so that should tell you something. So mm -hmm. yeah, the Heart Math Institute is very powerful technology. Where you can actually put a little device on and monitor the, the intervals um, to bring in that resonance and to bring in that coherence. And that's when we get into a state of, of peace. So- um, reminds me, yeah. Which reminds me of the medicine wheel because the opposite of the mind is the heart, the emotions. Mm -hmm. So we have that part of, of the, the medicine wheel and then the other would be uh, body and spirit. And you talked about, Noel, the spirit as well. And I'm taking a class or did take a class called Embodied Presence and it's going into the body and to experience our our sense of being not just in our brains but throughout the whole body and that's very powerful too mm. i haven't yeah. studied that but uh, karen should jump in here too because she does a process called heart math and karen would you just share a little bit about that uh, heart yeah heart thread I mean, 
Heart yeah, she just jumbled it. But um, I had, well, I purposely did not study heart math while I was embodying heart thread, which I've mm -hmm. done for 10 years now as a practitioner and I train practitioners. And um, so then I went ahead, I had met Greg Braden years back and, and then I went ahead and studied more of the heart math and it, all of its scientific research supported exactly what's happening and heart thread actually one of our first thursday when we started to go to the ccc weekly thursday calls they'd been happening monthly um i did one i think you'll also find it in the archives on heart thread and it's a simple simple modality with the complex deep results um and it's a modality where we connect in from the heart i will hear words or statements coming from the person's body and because we're connected in the field of the heart, the field of safety, unconditional love, the body won't take you where you're not ready to go. And then it's a process of repeating these statements aloud, words or statements, and it's phenomenal. A lot of instantaneous shifts and uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I love the heart math work. I box the little tool to use it when I do heart thread with people because it's all really <laughs> the same. Any conversation we're having from heart to heart, any, any interchange we're having from heart to heart, we are in a safe field and we are able to be our authentic self and be in truth and be in harmony. And I do believe that our Native American, our um, ancestors lived this innately. And um, it's part of why I moved back to New Mexico or moved to New Mexico five years ago to just be more in touch with the land and the Native American ways. So, yeah. Thank you, Karen. I put, really your, interesting. Uh, I put your website in the chat. Oh, perfect. Thank you. One of the things that John talks about is our ancestors and um, I think that's that's a whole another way area of communication that we can't measure, but we've all experienced that with um, having these insights. And I always think, oh, that's from you, mom, or, or something like this. You know, that feeling of that they are coming across in a different way. Um, we have, you know, as a Catholic, we have our saints and our. Um, our Lord, and we, we do have that spiritual connection again, so that that's another form of communication or whatever belief that you are in, your, your wisdom teachers that have passed on or, or a rabbi or, or whoever your teachers are. So I think that we are so interconnected and we're just learning new ways of communicating, not just through our head but as you were saying our brains through our bodies and then that that uh, connection with those who have passed on and our loved ones and our and as for John I think the Neanderthals were communicating with him I mean that chapter is so beautiful and he he, he just he he just told me too you know that he was so touched he was moved to tears when he was writing that it was so powerful Wow. So. Mm. Mm. Boy, let me see. Uh, we did, Tex said he was having some troubles with his audio. Uh, he said he wanted to ask uh, your marketing strategy considering yourself published. How do you get the word out about your books? Besides tonight. No strategy. <laughs> My strategy is no strategy. <laughs> this is it. This is it, folks. <laughs> For both our books, this is the only thing we've mm -hmm. done. <laughs> we need somebody to be a, a strategist for us. Um, we'll figure it out, I, I guess, as we go along. We just like to write books. <laughs> <laughs> what a gift. John, uh, regarding publishing your book, you know, we're all here shifting the paradigms, returning to some of the ways that worked wonderfully um, that our ancestors practice. And you, you know, you, we think it and it can become. So we can all right now in this moment have the knowingness and the thought in our mind that we, the people here and our people and their people and so on and so on will purchase your book. 
and it will just ripple effect from there. So I offer that intention and action. What an evening, what an there's, evening. There's only one thing that's quote unquote wrong, not wrong with this call. We what? never want to hang up the phone at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're tired or whatever. It's always hard to say goodbye and good night. The energy is so full of love. Everyone wants to stay connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you, everyone. We will, we will close. And uh, thank you so much, John and Catherine. Just love you. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. Your whole family. Delightfully. Yes. And your new cousin, Trish. <laughs> and the Come cat. back. Join us again.